Okay, it's on. Hopefully you can hear me okay, even at the back. Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much uh, to the Society for the invitation to be here today to answer the question, what is it like to work as a particle physicist? Um, it's a bit of a broad topic, so I interpreted it that um, a little bit to talk about myself and what the sort of day-to-day -day work as a particle physicist is like. Um, so first of all, I don't know what you think of initially when you hear a particle physicist. I think a lot of the general population probably have the idea of Brian Cox, <laughs> uh, but unfortunately you just have me today. Um, so quickly about me. So uh, I am a, uh, a grand title, Dame Kathleen Ollerenshaw Research Fellow. Um, so I started uh, in March this year. Um, and I'm a particle physicist working on both the ATLAS and the phaser experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what my job is. Um, but first, particle physics. This might be repeating things at a bit of basic level, but um, just so everyone's on the same page. So when I talk about particle physics, I'm talking about the physics concerning uh, the study of uh, fundamental particles, so all possible fundamental particles, and their interactions with each other. Um, so what you see here is the standard model of particle physics, which is the sort of complete picture that we have of the universe as we know it, uh, of the fundamental particles, so the quarks, the leptons, uh, the force bosons, and now the Higgs boson, which was recently discovered. And then uh, CERN is uh, the Europe's sort of uh, pioneering uh, organization for nuclear and particle physics research. And it uh, is home to the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which is the world's highest energy accelerator to date, which uh, mostly collides protons. Uh, so what this looks like in principle is you have this accelerator complex uh, in CERN where you um, inject protons or other types of particles. You can also collide hadron, uh, ions. Um, and so you inject uh, protons going into the ring in the LHC one way uh, and then also in the other way. And then once you've accelerated them uh, to the desired uh, center of mass energy, you then collide them within the ATLAS detector, uh, which looks something like this. So you get a spray of secondary particles using Einstein's E equals MC squared. And then uh, what my job is essentially to do is take those energy deposits in the detector and turn that into physics. Um, so this is uh, another picture, pretty, lots of pretty pictures of what the ATLAS experiment looks like. Um, so it's a uh, cylindrical shaped detector with many layers, like, like an onion. And each layer is sort of designed to do a particular thing or detect a particular type of particle. And you see that it surrounds the um, central collision point in order to detect all of the possible particles that are produced. Uh, this is what it looks like in practice. It's, it's very large, so you can't get the whole thing in one photo. And this is uh, me in the helmet, in the white helmet. Um, and then this is another diagram that sort of shows these uh, slices, this time uh, sort of from the transverse uh, angle and what different types of particles going through the detector might look like. Um, so for example, if you have a muon, it will interact very little with any parts of your detector and just go straight through to be detected in the muon spectrometer. But if you have an electron that will decay through electromagnetic showers in your electromagnetic calorimeter, so leave a deposit of energy, uh, similarly with a photon. And protons and neutrons are detected in the hadronic calorimeter. Um, and then neutrinos we can't detect at all. They're invisible to detectors like Atlas. Um, so I can't really talk about what it's like to be a particle physicist without talking about my career. I think um, it's not necessarily obvious if someone says I'm a particle physicist, I do research, what that means in terms of career stages. So I thought it's worth giving an example of what one career progression looks like. Um, so I actually did my MPhys here at the University of Manchester. I was sat where you are now um, doing my undergrad um, between the years of 2008 and 2012. Um, during my, uh, in between my third and fourth year as undergrad, I was very lucky to get a position as a CERN summer student. Um, so I spent the summer in 2011 at CERN doing a real research project. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I was then convinced to stay on uh, 
in Manchester. I did consider leaving, but I was pulled in <laughs> uh, to do my PhD here in the particle physics group in Manchester, uh, which I finished in 2015. And since then, uh, I've worked at both DAISY, which is the um, German National Research Lab, um, and at CERN, which uh, you've probably all heard of, um, as well as uh, doing a postdoctoral researcher position in Bonn University in Germany. Uh, and now I'm back, as of earlier this year, uh, in Manchester as a member of staff. So um, I just wanted to mention the CERN Summer Student Programme a bit more because um, I think that was really uh, sort of set the foundations for me and set me on my, the career path that I definitely wanted to do a career in particle physics research. Um, so this was a 12-week um, uh, position based at CERN, so it was also paid, uh, where I really joined a research group and had hands-on research experience um, at CERN, surrounded by everything, um, you know, going on at the same time. So I met um, a load of people uh, on the same program who I'm still friends with today and who have gone on to either also pursue careers in particle physics or in other areas of physics, um, so for example gravitational waves. Um, and so my particular research project was studying uh, low mass uh, dimuon resonances using the CMS detector, which is not what I do now, but it was still invaluable experience um, and uh, yeah, really, really great to do. Um, so I particularly mention this because the applications for the CERN Summer Student Programme for 2023, so next summer, are about to open. So they're meant to open in uh, November, uh, so any time now. Um, so I put the link, you can also feel free to drop me an email if you want to ask more about it. Um, there are also summer student programs at DAISY, where I also worked in Germany. They also have a very good uh, summer student program. Their applications open in December. And also RAL, which is sort of the UK um, national lab, also do a summer student program. I don't know so much about that one, but um, I put links anyway, you can find out more. Um, there's also opportunities for summer research projects at the University of Manchester and um, also you will generally gain research experience through, for example, MFIS projects if you do one with the particle physics group. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more, you can ask anyone in the particle physics group or you can ask me um, if you're interested. Um, so as I mentioned, I did my PhD at the University of Manchester. Um, so I, uh, my thesis was on the first study of the behaviour of the Higgs boson. So it had just been discovered in the summer and then I started my PhD in September. So it was a very exciting time. Uh, and I studied the properties of the Higgs boson decaying into two photons. Um, so you see this very famous plot of the diphoton invariant mass spectrum with this tiny little bump on top of it and that's the Higgs boson. Um, and uh, so this was... Um, a very exciting time to be a particle physicist, um, but it was also uh, um, a sort of great time overall doing a PhD. I really enjoyed my time doing a PhD. Um, so as part of this, I did a two-year stay on site uh, at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, so that really lets you uh, meet with colleagues face to face, um, you know, network, uh, take part in day-to-day -day detector operations. So while the LHC is running, uh, we have to keep the detector running. And so you need a whole shift crew to, to make that happen. And so um, part of the reason why I was based there was to help with that. Um, I also uh, took part in more social activities. I learned to ski, now I'm pretty good at skiing. <laughs> um, and also made friends from all around the world. It's, it's a really nice um, place to be, very international, very multicultural. Um, it was very busy and quite stressful at times, um, but I also learned many new skills along the way. So um, data analysis, statistical interpretations, lots of programming, uh, also more transferable soft skills like how to communicate with colleagues in meetings, how to present your work in a way that they'll understand, managing your time if you've got lots of different things as part of your PhD, and then writing everything in uh, peer-reviewed journals at the end, or, or in fact a PhD thesis. Um, so after I completed my PhD, I then moved to Hamburg in Germany and started my first job um, as a uh, research fellow. 
So research fellow is kind of a fancy term for a postdoc, postdoctoral researcher, but at a lab. So um, DAISY is a lab rather than a university, which has a slightly different, um, let's say, like working environment, but um, it's still at the end of the day, you're still doing research. Um, so the topic of, uh, that I decided to work on there was looking for dark matter produced in association with top quark. So we think that um, dark matter could be due to new, a new fundamental particle, and if so, it could be produced in the LHC and might be produced more prolifically with heavy particles like top quarks. So that was the motivation for doing this search. Um, and as part of my first postdoc, this was really my time to sort of learn to become an independent researcher. So um, whereas as a PhD student, you sort of work very closely with your supervisor and they kind of have the project oversight and guide you, you do the work, but they sort of guide you where, um, you know, what might be interesting to pursue. Um, as a postdoc, you, you become more independent. You need to think about what might be interesting, come up with new ideas or um, new physics that might be interesting to study, as well as starting to supervise uh, PhD students even. Um, and generally broadening your research experience. So don't stay funneled in the one topic that you did during your PhD. Uh, so after DAISY, I then moved to CERN as a CERN fellow. Um, and again, here was all about becoming an independent researcher, but here I think I really had the building on the experience at DAISY sort of became even more independent and started initiating and leading new projects um, with also a broader scope of research interests. Um, so I changed my uh, research focus um, to look uh, to, to sort of initiate a new search um, in Atlas looking for um, what's called heavy Majorana neutrinos. So these are hypothesized um, very heavy neutrinos uh, that could explain why standard model neutrinos uh, have, um, or the neutrinos that we see around us have such low mass through this uh, so-called seesaw mechanism. Um, and I, uh, yeah, we looked at it in a particular new production channel called vector boson fusion. Um, I also used the time at CERN to join a new project, and this is called Phaser, has a bit of a forced acronym, um, but <laughs> this was uh, really me taking a step in uh, an even broader direction. So before then, all I'd, all I'd done is really analyze data that we'd uh, taken with the detector and help with the running of it. This, is, this was uh, uh, um, an experiment that had been proposed but wasn't built yet. So I really helped uh, design, install, and commission a brand new detector in the LHC tunnel. So this was a very exciting thing to be part of. It's a relatively small team. Um, so I don't know if you know, but Atlas, the Atlas collaboration consists of around 3,000 people at any one given time. So it's a huge uh, a group of people to be working with. Uh, whereas Phaser, when I joined, was around 50 people. So I knew everyone, and um, it was really kind of efficient and a great learning experience for me. Um, in particular, since I didn't have any hands-on hardware experience, but by the end I was, you know, soldering, plugging in cables on my hands and knees, hard hat, everything uh, in the LHC tunnel. Um, so just to talk a bit more about Phaser because it's kind of like my baby. <laughs> so the main idea behind it is that some particles that are hypothesized uh, that are produced in collisions in Atlas wouldn't necessarily be detected by Atlas. Um, so they might fly uh, several hundred meters away from Atlas before they can be detected. Um, one such hypothesized particle is a dark photon, which um, could be um, an explanation for dark matter. It could be a mediator, we say, um, between normal matter and dark matter. And so the idea is if you place a detector 500 meters away from Atlas, you could then detect decays of particles like dark photons into, back into standard model particles. Um, so Phaser is looking for what we call long-lived new particles, um, and it's just started taking data um, this year when the LHC turned back on. And this is another pretty picture of, you can see it's right next to the LHC tunnel, um, and we really have to like go, go down underground where Atlas is, it's about 90 meters underground, and then walk 500 meters along the LHC tunnel, then we have a little step ladder to get, go over the LHC, and then we get to our detector. <laughs> 
And uh, yeah, as of March this year, I'm now back at the University of Manchester. Uh, lovely to be back in the UK um, as a Dame Kathleen Ollerenshaw Fellow. Uh, so what that means is I'm an, now uh, an independent staff researcher. I will get PhD students and it will eventually, after five years, convert into a lectureship. Um, and so what the topic of my research fellowship is to look for new physics, so um, particles and forces beyond the standard model that couple to leptons uh, with a combined approach with the Atlas and Phaser experiments. So what's the day-to-day -day work like then? Um, so you might expect it to be lots of fun, lots of money, but in reality it's uh, juggling many different things. It can be quite stressful, lots of coffee, particle physics is fueled on caffeine, um, but there are good things as well. Uh, Okay, so um, I would say it's hard to define like a standard day of work because it really changes a lot, especially for me, depending on what I'm working on at a given time. And it, so it can change from month to month or year to year and will naturally sort of develop with your research profile and progress. So in general, what some day-to-day -day work looks like is um, data analysis, so manipulation, visualization, interpretation of data. Uh, research and development, either on hardware or on the theory side. Um, attending meetings, I spend a lot of time in Zoom calls. Um, also communicating and sharing results with colleagues, um, so coffee chats, things like that. Um, attending conferences and workshops, so um, more so before COVID, but uh, I travelled, I used to travel a lot um, to all sorts of exotic places, it's a lot of fun. Um, writing papers, um, so an important part of your work is to you know, publish the outcomes of your research in peer-reviewed journals and also supervising uh, PhD students or more junior postdocs, um, you know, helping them with their analyses uh, and now that I'm back at university, also taking part in teaching. Um, so just to give you a bit more of an idea of what data analysis looks like on Atlas, because I think this is quite a um, unusual setup and um, people are quite surprised when they find out that I can do my job pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, and this is by design because we have collaborators from all around the world. So everyone's got to be able to access the data and share their results. Um, so the idea is at the top we have raw data coming from Atlas, so this is binary data coming out from our detector, um, and then we have what's called a trigger. So this decides whether we want to keep an event, whether it's interesting or not, because the data flow is so huge that we can't keep all of the uh, data, we have to filter it some way. Uh, so we go from about 20 megahertz to 500 hertz. And this um, means that we have around 10 petabytes a year of raw data coming from just the Atlas detector. That's not counting other um, detectors uh, in the LHC. Um, then we store this data on the worldwide computing grid. Um, so this is uh, kind of pioneered by CERN and by the LHC as a way of sharing the data. Um, so this means instead of uh, us um, pulling the data to our computers and then running code over it, we send our code to the data and the data is stored, distributed all around the world. Um, and this allows us to be on a beach in Hawaii or in Manchester in the rain and still do the same thing. Um, and so we have both raw data and simulated data. Um, so this again is something that's not common in other fields. If you asked a biologist about having simulations or comparing to predictions, they'd look at you funny because that's just not what they do. But it's very common in particle physics where we, we say we know what the underlying physics should look like. We have the standard model. It's a, a mathematical model. And so we can generate, simulate some events. Um, and we know what they look like. So we have the raw data from the real data, and then we also have Monte Carlo, um, which is simulated data, and then we can compare these in our analysis. Does our data look like what we expect from the underlying physics? Um, this then goes into analysis, so we have our own, within Atlas, our own um, data analysis frameworks. We have one called Athena, um, and then 
typically the output of this would be smaller data sets of gigabyte, terabyte, which we then analyze with um, root possibly, or you know, more and more so nowadays like standard Python libraries, um, data analysis libraries. Um, and just to point out, like particle physics is essentially one of the leading fields for big data. You know, we were doing data science before it was a real job title. Like, the, it, data scientist is, is a term that's been invented in like the past 10 years since I <laughs> worked in particle physics. Um, so really, as a particle physicist, you develop a proficiency in all aspects of data analysis, visualization, interpretation. Um, so especially program, programming languages like C++ and Python, they're key. Uh, lots of analyses, lots more use machine learning, so they use also standard um, Python and um, industry machine learning libraries. Also data visualization, so Root is like a um, particle physics specific uh, data analysis library, but you can also use um, standard libraries. This is becoming more common, I think, um, as they get better and more flexible. Um, and to point out that this aspect of the job in particular uh, means that even if you did a PhD in particle physics, maybe one postdoc, you still have a lot of transferable skills that you can go then. If you decide research isn't for you anymore, you can move to um, industry or another research institute. Um, so many of my friends now work in uh, places like Google or the Alan Turing Institute, which um, is like the UK uh, data science and machine learning um, hub. Um, so you build up all of these um, transferable skills. <clears throat> uh, the job description is also incredibly broad and that allows you to do uh, a wide range of things and this is something that I really appreciate about the job. Um, if I decide that I want to work on, if, if I think something's really interesting about uh, designing the next generation of particle detectors, I can collaborate with uh, engineer colleagues and really work on, you know, what is the, the next generation in terms of uh, silicon detector research and development and, and re really get involved in that. Or I can decide that uh, I have a particular problem on my analysis and so I can collaborate with machine learning experts um, and try and develop some new ideas from that. Or indeed work with theorists and develop new theories and publish um, papers on, on the theories. There's a sort of broad range of things and your career profile is constantly changing as with what you find interesting basically um, <clears throat> and uh, what you get funded to do of course. Um, communicating your research is also incredibly important um, so you have to be able to communicate your research results uh, or indeed new ideas to peers so you have to convince uh, your colleagues that your results are sensible and also enthuse your colleagues about your new ideas, you know, get people on board with, with a new thing. Um, I already mentioned I'm lucky to have traveled all around the world giving talks at conferences, you know, US, Asia, um, Africa, um, and attending workshops. Um, written communication is also important, so publishing your research in peer-reviewed journals, that's essentially what universities use as a measure of how good you are as a researcher as your uh, paper output. Um, and so this is also incredibly important. Um, but I think also communicating the outcomes of the research to the general public is also very important. So the UK government essentially contributes directly to CERN funding. You know, um, CERN is funded by a group of what are called member states. Uh, the UK of which is one of them, and that allows the UK certain privileges in terms of um, we get UK fellows and things like that. Um, and so, you know, the UK taxpayer is basically funding my research, and so I think it's important to communicate what we're doing back to the public. Um, so as part of this, I've been fortunate to take part in, um, you know, TV and radio interviews, not quite on the level of Brian Cox, obviously. <laughs> Um, podcasts, um, social media live, science festivals, open days um, when I was at CERN and DAISY and also Atlas Underground visits. Um, so there's lots of different you know, things you can get involved in, different aspects of the job that you can get involved in um, depending on what you find fun. Um, so this is my last slide, so just some final thoughts. So 
I've painted maybe an enthusiastic picture. Research is challenging at times. It certainly isn't suited to everyone. Um, so if you're interested in doing a PhD, either in particle physics or something else, I'd highly recommend to get some experience through an internship or a project before deciding, before committing. Um, I think it isn't a general, uh, specific thing to particle physics. Um, but academia in general has a certain lack of job stability as well. So you saw with my career profile that I moved every two or three years until I got this position at Manchester, which I enjoyed um, to a certain extent. Uh, it means you get to live in a different country, experience a different uh, culture and make new friends. But after a time, this becomes, um, uh, I won't say tedious, but um, you, you want to eventually settle down at some point. Uh, and so um, getting a sort of permanent, this is where I'm going to be in the next 10 years, can be a challenge. Um, that said, I do find the research incredibly interesting and rewarding. No day looks the same, which I really appreciate. And there are constantly opportunities to learn and grow throughout the career. It's, um, research is basically kind of like constantly being at university, you know, undergrad, except you're writing the textbooks rather than learning them. Um, and you get to meet and collaborate with people from all around the world. Um, so I'm constantly humbled that my day job is literally understanding the universe. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Yeah. Very happy to take questions. Yeah. Uh, they're not currently, but I think I, c I can share them and then you can, if you want to share them with the society, yeah. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. yeah. I have one question. Um, a lot of people that go into research mention uh, that big word that is the imposter syndrome. Mm. Um, I wanted to know like, if you've ever felt like that and what you would recommend. All the time, <laughs> literally all the time. Um, no, I, I get it really bad personally. And um, especially as a woman in science, sometimes I worry that did I get a position because I'm a woman and people are trying to like readdress the gender balance and things like that, for me personally specifically. Um, I don't know if I have any specifically good advice for that because I, struggle with it to be honest to this day um, but I think it's just something that you know you you, you continue despite the, the sort of nagging question in the back of your mind and um, a, a good way for me is to discuss with colleagues like um, you know I, I don't know if you're thinking like oh is this bit of research that I'm doing like or is this uh, an avenue I'm going with is this like is this silly? Is this, you know, interesting? And sort of getting that validation from uh, peers in the community. Um, yeah, that, that helps. But otherwise, I think it's more of a sort of fake it till you make it kind of um, <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so an undergraduate is... <laughs> very structured it's like you have your lectures you have your problem sheets you have your labs it's sort of um your day is kind of timetabled for you um whereas a phd is uh or any kind of postgrad study I, that's research based is um very much you have to manage your own time um so your supervisor should help you with that in some respect you know and uh guide you if you're going a bit astray but um, you have to kind of juggle that time for yourself um, and yeah get get good at time management it's something I'm constantly trying to work on you know getting better at time management um, as you progress through the career you get more and more things put on you um, but yeah I think um, it's sort of a lot more free doing a postgraduate you know 
some, I think some days I went into the office and I thought I would maybe be doing one thing that day and then uh, I got an email from my supervisor like, oh, we urgently need to do this check or something and then I'd spend the rest of the day doing that um, rather than what I'd originally intended. Um, so you have to be very flexible um, and, yeah, manage your time. Juggle deadlines, different deadlines as well. Um, and also deadlines that aren't necessarily fixed in stone. So obviously you have, like, as an undergrad, exams. Like, you know when they're going to be and that's it. Whereas with research, sometimes you're trying to hit a moving target. Like, uh, you might say, oh, we want to finish this... Um, this paper uh, next month and then something comes up and it's like kind of get, gets pushed and then maybe that overlaps with another commitment you have. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah? Would you say it's possible to change your career path? Say you're doing a PhD in experimental medical physics but then you realize you're more of a theorist. Is that kind of possible? Or uh, it's definitely possible, yeah. Um, so, as I think I mentioned, like you have opportunities really to collaborate with other, like with theorists or engineers, like depending on what. I, I consider experimental particle physics to be kind of in the middle, and then you have like engineers on one side and theorists on another side, like real pure theory. Um, but people go between the two all the time. Um, I mean, between the three all the time. And um, particularly here in Manchester, but also other universities, we have quite strong collaboration links between the theorists and the experimentalists. Like, we all sit on the same corridor. Um, and so that really facilitates, like, moving between the different fields. Um, it is quite a vague thing to be what it means to be... Uh, a theorist or an experimental particle physicist. There's like a lot of grey area in between, so you could have really fundamental theoretical particle physics, but most particle physics is, that, that is theory-led involves some experimental aspects, so a lot of it's what we call phenomenology, where you say, I have a theory and now I'm going to translate that to what it would look like and like, or, or what sort of analysis you should do to look for that, and then the experimentalist might pick that up and like do it so um, but I know um, yeah I can think of colleagues who have uh, done uh, certainly experimental and then gone more into the theory side but it's also possible to go the other way yeah uh, yeah Yeah, uh, I mean, apply for as many as possible because it's like a massive lottery. <laughs> so I've also been the other side where I was a supervisor, like picking uh, people out of the pool. And um, I think getting like someone to write you an enthusiastic reference letter. So you have to like there's an application and then uh, I think you have to have a reference letter. And so I think my supervisor at CERN told me that he picked me because uh, someone wrote him the reference letter that like I'm very independent or something like that like I, I would work well you know independently or with like people but he, he wanted someone who he could leave alone because he was going on holiday for four weeks so, <laughs> um, so it, there's a lot of luck to it and don't be discouraged if you don't get any of them but um, yeah you know, if you have the grades and you have like a good reference letter to back that up, then um, that certainly gets you a long way there. Uh, yeah. And when the explosion was discovered, all the PhDs you just scrambling for, um, for pieces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not quite. So, the I mean, there were a lot more people working on Higgs than there probably are now. Um, but the way that uh, like thesis topics are sort of work in the big collaborations is you have to have a way of distributing fairly like what different people work on and it, it tends to work out like but um, you don't have everyone working on Higgs and then something else like gets uh, some measurement gets um, abandoned you know that's part of the job of the spokesperson and the coordinators of the experiment 
um, say like these are our priority areas and then um, yeah in order to do a particular analysis your supervisor has to talk to them make sure that's okay that sort of thing um, I didn't mention it maybe I should have mentioned it like particularly in the large experiments there's a lot of politics I mean that's any large collaboration you get yeah a lot of politics but yeah you don't have to worry about that as a PhD student <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't know that. Um, in fact, I was pretty much convinced I wanted to do soft QCD physics, which is kind of what I did for my under, uh, placement program. That was what my placement supervisor was interested in, so I was like, oh, this is the bee's knees, this is the best thing ever, because I'd only been experienced, exposed to one thing. And um, the way that they did projects in Manchester, at least in those days, was they had you know, a new cohort of PhD students and a number of projects. And we had to basically decide amongst ourselves who wanted what project. <laughs> um, and I basically got the hard sell for that particular project. Um, and it worked out well in the end, I think. Um, yeah. I think it's a mixture of the, I won't say the, the project doesn't matter, but I think the, the topic is probably less important than um, kind of how you work with your supervisor. Um, because as you've seen, I've worked on lots of different areas of particle physics and they're all kind of, the skills you get are all transferable between them. So yes, you need something that you find interesting, but if you're, if you're interested in particle physics, you'd probably find any of them interesting or could motivate yourself. But your relationship with your PhD supervisor is very important. Like I've seen some people who struggled because either their communication styles or like um, didn't work or like the supervisor uh, wanted to meet once a month and they wanted more like you know to, to touch base more often um, but yeah um, I say I got a good vibe let's say from my supervisor and uh, it worked out really well so that's sort of how I picked um, yeah uh, yeah <laughs> That's a very good question that I didn't mention. Um, so actually, one of the pros of this job is that if I'm not feeling like working one day, I can probably just squeeze the hours into another day, as long as I don't have teaching commitments. That is like um, so, especially with uh, like working from home being more normal nowadays. Like it's very easy with this kind of job to just go, oh, if I don't have any meetings and I'm not motivated to work today I'll just squeeze it into like the rest of the work week um, so that sort of flexible working is like definitely an option uh, it's definitely not a nine-to-five job um, because you tend to work in waves like there'll be a project coming to completion you're publishing a paper or you've got a conference deadline or something and you have to put in the hours to complete the work in order to get that done and so, especially as a PhD student and younger postdoc, before I got better at defending my like personal lifetime, I was working a lot of evenings and weekends. Um, but that was something that I had to sort of learn for myself and kind of care a little bit less about other people, like going, oh, we need to get this done by this time, and really just defend my personal time. Now, I never work on the weekends. Um, and rarely on the evenings. If there's a deadline, maybe day before, maybe I will work late, but uh, I really protect my weekends and um, sometimes I have to travel on like a Sunday or a Saturday or whatever, but it happens, but mostly um, I do protect that. Um, <clears throat> hours, sometimes I'm working longer than nine to five during the week, it's true. <laughs> um, but again, you, you, it tends to come in waves. So you'll have times where everything's kind of compressed and you're working longer hours, and then you have other times when 
the, the load is lighter and so you can take a little bit of time and I don't feel guilty doing that because, you know, you worked more the other time. It sort of all works out in the end, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, like, for your PhD, do you get to do any practical stuff or was it, like, only data analysis and stuff? Uh, so for my PhD, I only did data analysis. Uh, I was not keen on doing anything practical <laughs> for my PhD. Um, and that's also just how it works out. Um, I don't know why. I think I was maybe scared with undergraduate labs. I wasn't very good at them. <laughs> um, so I didn't want to do anything like hands-on. But um, as you saw during my CERN fellow, I decided actually I wanted to try it and really enjoyed it. Um, there are opportunities, especially now, because um, so we're going to upgrade the Atlas detector, and so Manchester is heavily involved um, in upgrade projects. So there's lots of opportunities to get hands-on in the lab if you want to, but also you don't have to if you don't want to. So. Yeah. Um, so when you applied for your PhD, did you choose something? Uh, Specific, or was it just say whatever um, particle physics area? Uh, yes, yeah, so the way that the PhD positions work in the UK, at least, um, so there, so you can get funded positions with um, STFC, so the Science Technology Facilities Council, um, and each university gets each year a certain number of those, um, and you apply all sort of at the same time. It's a bit like UCAS, but less structured. Um, and so you can apply to, I think, as many universities as you want for a PhD position, for one of their funded PhD positions. Um, and none of those places will ask you to say what you want to work on before you get it. In fact, I don't think they'll tell you until you get there and you start your PhD sort of what the area is going to work on. Um, a lot of the time they have a lot of flexibility. You know, you'll have more academics than PhD students starting and more ideas of what they want new students to work on than they have students. Um, so there's often like choice from that respect. Yeah. But you can also have a look what, uh, so most universities will have like a website where they say what sort of areas they're working on. So you can get an idea of what sort of possible topics they might offer projects on. Um, like I think Manchester, I think we're designing a new website that has all of this, but you can get an idea of what sort of rough areas um, that we're working on. Uh, yeah. Does that also apply to like MSc? To MSc, sorry. Uh, to the master's graduate. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm less familiar with the MSc, but um, I believe so. Yeah. So we work with the same Oh, with the funding? Uh, no. No, so they're I no, so they're paid, I think. You have to yeah. Or get a loan. Um, yeah. SCFC only funds the student trips, but if you get one, they're really great because they also fund things like the two year trip to CERN, so you get yeah, things like that as part of it. Uh, yeah, was there one more? Yeah. yeah do you know what portion of what a portion of like um astrophysics do like theory? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, my impression is there's a lot less theorists than there are experimentalists, and there's a lot less funded. There's certainly a lot less funded places per year to do theory specifically. Um, yeah, there's, there's there's less on average, I think. But I can't I can't say more than like yeah. Um, I mean, yes and no. There's nothing stopping you applying for both. Uh, I think, I mean, one of my friends applied for a theoretical PhD position and then I think ended up being offered an experimental one or something like that. <laughs> um, because I don't think they were quite sure which they wanted and the, yeah, in the end they gave them what they thought was, uh, yeah more applicable, I guess. Um, 
but yeah, there's, there's certainly less funded PhD positions. And also something to be aware of is the funding cycle, the application cycle is, I think, different. I'm not 100% sure on that. You might need to apply earlier if you're doing a theory one because it's funded through a slightly different route. But I don't, I'm afraid I don't know the details of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you say particle physics is a bit more unpredictable than other fields? Ooh, I mean, that's hard to say because I've not worked in other fields. <laughs> unpredictable in what sense? Um, as in the results that you expect? Um, I'd say, if anything, it's more predictable than other fields because we have this standard model, this mathematical model, um, that is very, very precise and very, very good at describing the data and infuriatingly good at describing the data because we're really nitpicking and trying to find deviations and things that go beyond it because we see from other observations that it's not quite right, but we can't find out why it's not right. Um, so in that sense, it's both more predictable and less predictable, yes. <laughs> Sorry, that was a terrible answer, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's true. Main technical challenges. Um, yeah, so what we're talking about, well, what CERN is talking about doing next. Um, so, whenever we're doing our research on our current collider, we're always thinking about what the next collider is going to be. Um, so, what we're thinking about doing next is, uh, well, there's several proposals on the table, and no one has been unilaterally agreed on, agreed on yet, but one option. Uh, proposed by CERN is called the FCC, so Future Circular Collider. It's a very original name. Um, and that's going to be huge um, and much higher energy than the LHC. So there's lots of technical challenges that need to be overcome before we can get to that point. Um, things like digging that tunnel, because it will go like under the lake in Geneva and under mountains. So from a civil engineering perspective, lots of challenges. Um, <clears throat> from, from an accelerator perspective, we don't have the magnet technology yet to do that. Um, people are working on it, but we essentially need more powerful magnets that work with less um, power. Um, and power is now becoming, because of the current um, climate in Europe, is becoming more and more of a pressing uh, box to tick when it comes to considering future um, technologies. Um, and also from the detector point of view, if we go to higher energies and higher intensities, you have to build detectors that can cope with that. Um, there I think we're quite, uh, there I would say we're a lot closer than the accelerator technologies in terms of getting there. Um, and then the final thing that needs to be ticked is um, computing. So I mentioned we have this huge influx of data and you need uh, fast computing, uh, data storage in order to deal with this. Um, so this is also something that's going to be a problem at some point and um, yeah. So lots of, lots of interesting problems to be tackled by bright young researchers. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. yeah, if there's no other questions, yeah? All right. Thank or was, was that one? Yeah. One. Yes, uh, I mean CERN isn't just LHC, it does lots of different projects. I mean it also has a really strong nuclear physics program, so it has um, 
Isolde, which uh, I don't know if any of you were taught by Sean Freeman, but he was a lecturer, was a very good lecturer at Manchester, and has now moved to CERN to be the spokesperson for Isolde. He's a nuclear physicist. Um, there's also uh, Physics Beyond Colliders group at CERN, which um, do uh, kind of focus more on smaller experiments beyond the main collider setup. Um, and then finally, uh, we do some space experiments. So there's CAST, which is uh, a telescope looking for um, dark matter coming from the sun, and also AMS, uh, which is on the space station, which is a detector that was built at CERN and then is on the International Space Station. Um, so there's lots of different things going on at CERN. Um, I, I'm sure there's still things that I've never come across in the years that I've been there. Um, but yeah, lots of things at CERN. That um, <clears throat> One thing I maybe didn't mention that as a CERN fellow, when you get that position, you literally can work on whatever you want. I chose to stay working on Atlas and joined Phaser, but you can literally work on whatever you want that CERN does. So it's a really good position to have. Okay, then we'll maybe wrap up here. Um, I put my email address, I'll send a link to the slide so you can circulate those if you want. Um, so feel free to drop me an email if you have more questions. Yeah. Uh, we'll try to put it maybe on the Instagram story, uh, a link to yeah. the PowerPoint so you can see it there. Uh, thank you for coming. Let's give it Thanks a lot. <laughs>